Mach 3, give me cruise show on 2, 3, and 4. Show on 1, actually. 6, 3. Mach 3, give me start line 2. 5, I'll Mach 3, give me start line 2. Mach 3, give me start line 1. And cruise show on 7 and 9. Line 1, cruise show 7 and 9, Mach 3. Hey, do something. I hate that. Super Ops, Line 3, Red Avionics. Super Ops, Line 7 is Code 3 for light in the gear handle. Fuck. Okay, so today I'm having a conversation with Eric Stromsky. Uh, those that have listened to the podcast or watched the videos, he was in our QA video and our production video, and he's still uh, adorned with his military regalia behind him on the video. Um, so today we're kind of going to talk about, uh, what I refer to in my retirement speech as a wink and a nod maintenance, but it's really about TO compliance and enforcement of standards. Um, so Eric, why don't you kind of give everybody a back, your military background and, and your experience, and then we can go from there. Sure. Um, so, you know, I did 21 years active duty, uh, retired as a master sergeant a couple years ago. Um, I, I spent uh, my first part of my career in the back shop in the engine, engine, engine world, uh, worked mod repair, um, uh, JIM, uh, moved on to QA, you know, was a staff sergeant in QA. Uh, from there, I went to run a support section. Um, and then from there, uh, did some pro supering over to Holloman. Ended up being a lead pro super and went over to QA again as a chief inspector. Um, and then ended my career running a support section for the last uh, about six months or so. So uh, a little bit everywhere, a little bit flight line. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I did work flight line for the 61st for about four years in the middle there. So I've been a little bit everywhere. Yeah, uh, so Eric got to Holloman maybe four, four or five months before I did, uh, when it was first standing up in 2014. I showed up in August. And what was really interesting it was is uh, – we had pretty much been stationed at Luke the whole time together, and our paths never crossed until I showed up. Uh, well, it crossed technically well, in, at NCO Academy. NCO Academy, yeah. <laughs> when I got a display release for cheating, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> fucking ridiculous. Stick <laughs> that shit. Uh, that anyway, funny. yeah. So our paths briefly crossed there. Uh, and then when I showed up at Holloman, I was um, slotted to be a pro super, uh, and Eric was a swing ship pro super, correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I, I became yep. the midship pro super. Uh, and then uh, we pretty much, uh, you know, stuck with each other through a lot of stuff. We were both lead supers at the same time. And then we were both up at QA after I was out of my exile and at EOR for that brief stint. Um, so, you know, I, I invite Eric here to these conversations because we've had a lot of these conversations when we were, we were sitting around in QA kind of identif identifying things that are really fucked up. And Part of what we were kind of grasping at then was we couldn't understand why what seems to be plainly obvious to us as two people that have never done anything beyond supering, uh, why things were were so obvious to us, but but so ignored or, or not seen by senior leadership. So um, really what I want to talk about today is, like I said, like wink and a, wink and a nod type of uh, maintenance culture. So do you remember... When we were at Holloman in the beginning, maybe, uh, maybe not the beginning, but maybe six or seven months in, and we didn't have an engine emergency warning tester. Yeah, it was busted. Yeah, it was busted, and we, you know, the parts couldn't. Oh, it was, it was, it was. It was there was like one with a digital gauge, and there was an analog gauge or something like right. that. And it was basically completely inoperative, and Correct. we had changed an RPM gauge, or I think it was an RPM gauge or, or an FT gauge, something small. And it was required for the follow-on maintenance to do the engine emergency warning tester because it's much more than just doing an engine run. You're you're dialing in specifically the 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 resistance to the gauge of okay, I'm going to set it at 600. I need to verify the gauge is at 600 plus or minus five or 10 degrees or whatever it is. And uh, we didn't have that. And after about a day, I I very distinctly remember uh, certain people in senior leadership positions really just kind of going okay well, let's just run it and call it a day. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You know, when we first um, started standing up Holloman, you know, the, the support was was pretty limited, right? They were still standing up their support section. And, um, you know, it's a tough thing to do to start up uh, uh, flying uh, actively F-16s with, with, uh, with nothing set up, really. I mean, age wasn't set up. Uh, 
support. Mock really wasn't set up for us, um, you know, and they wanted to kind of hit the ground running as soon as the jets started landing. You know, I remember, I think it was about less than two weeks from the time the first jet landed to the time I think we were flying that first sortie or trying to at least. Um, there was all kinds of questions in the air about uh, rules and regulations, you know, um, was it, you know, are, are we following Holloman subs? Are we following Luke Air Force Base <laughs> subs? I mean, it was, it was crazy. No one really knew uh, up from down. And um, the, the feeling I got when I got there was it was kind of like a TDY, right? A little bit right. like a TDY. Like, you know what? We're just going to get whatever it takes to get the job done. And that, that was being impressed from the top down because um, these, these chiefs and stuff, when they're spinning up a squadron and, you know, uh, our lead super at the time, I remember him, he – they wanted to fly that first sortie, right? And when we were we were having these things break early goings, and they wanted to show that we can we can get it done and foregoing tests like a follow-on maintenance um, because they they use the engine run for a catch-all, right? Right. I mean, we'll well we'll just fire up the engine and, and yeah. we'll catch all the problems that we're having. Which um, is which is kind of arrogant, right? Because you're basically saying completely. I know more I know more than the people that built this jet. Well, <laughs> you just leave yourself wide open for right, right. for for major problems when you, after you do maintenance and you're like, well, we'll just fire it up and see what happens. And, you know, part of it was that the setup wasn't correct. Um, there was not, not enough equipment, not enough, you know, not enough, a lot of stuff, um, but they still wanted to fly those sorties mm -hmm. and get them going. So yeah, that was the kind of the feeling. And I, and I remember that specifically with that tester, um, that was the turn. Oh, we'll just catch it on the engine run. And, you know, someone's like, well, are you going to run the engine? Because right. I'm not. Right? Yeah, and I think I was actually, I don't think it was that early. And I'm pretty sure I had just moved into the section as a spec section chief. And I explicitly mm. told the engine guys, there is not a fucking way that you are going to violate tech data and be okay with me. And that wasn't like I, w I was saying I was going to harm them. You know, it was more right. of, I will not back you up for this. And I will back you for standing up for following the TO. And right. it, it's, it's interesting to see, like, I am not necessarily an advocate to use the TO all the time. I think like uh, a few people that know my story know that, you know, my time at EOR or, or anything that I, I would do, if you go completely by the book, you're almost going to be essentially paralyzed. Uh, right. but, but part of that is being able to say, okay, some of these things aren't necessarily the most important thing, but I, as the Colonel, I'm going to take the heat for this. I'm going to waive this, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take the responsibility, but it wasn't like that. It was, it was from the squadron down, hey, just super, you know, tell the guys they just need to get it done. There's no reason why an engine run can't do it. But nobody was willing to take responsibility for it. Nobody was willing to put their name on it to waive that TO requirement, which is absolutely something a group commander can, can do. A group commander can go, yep, we're not going to do that today because. You know, and, and I, I think some of the group commanders we had there when we first got there, um, I, I think some of them were actually, you know, squadron commanders, group commanders, were actually willing to do that, knowing the situation we're in. I mean, if you don't, elevate your issues to, to leadership and say, Hey, here's our problem. Here's a, here's our way around it. Here's right. how we can, you know, it, it's not by tech order, but it is safe. And it is something that, you know, cause you, the commander is supposed to be listening to his experts. You've been in for 20 right. plus years, you know? Yep. Um, and he makes that call. Um, hey, that's great. That's what he's there for. Right. You know, um, it's when he doesn't, you know, it's when he's not notified and the calls made for him, right. By somebody else. Or, he has implied the call he wants junior people to make in, you know, like I want that jet flown and I understand we don't have the tester, but we need to fly stories. It's ridiculous. We're not flying sorties. And then every spineless chief and whoever that understands what the commander is asking for will right. go down and pressure all the people. And eventually they're going to find somebody that doesn't well, have, you know, that isn't going to stand up to, you know, something that's not okay. But that's the problem, right? They'll, right? they'll keep digging until they find somebody. And there's always somebody. And whether, you know, you could have that gun ho guy shooting for a stripe, want to make it look good. Maybe it's the guy that wants to make shit happen. Or the brand you know? new seven level that literally doesn't right. know any better. You right. know, a uh, new person to, to, to the team, right? They just they have no idea. Some people, they'll, I'm not running that jet. You know, I'm not, you, you can kiss my ass. I'm not, yep. there's nothing you can do to make me break tech at it right now. If the calls me made by a super or or, a, or expediter, that's one thing. Um, when your commander makes the call, you should yep. have all the confidence in the world. Yep. Absolutely, hey, I'm good to go. Yeah, we've seen those too, where people actually won't even. Man, I think it was um, uh, engine guy uh, Chuck. 
right? Yep. There was some stuff where we, I, I, I couldn't convince him. I'm like, look, I don't know what else to tell you. I have the words straight from the commander. We're, right. we're good to go on that sealant, right? Mm -hmm. And he still wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't sign off, wouldn't do it. Yep. And I'm like, well, so we had to find someone that would, or it ended up being me. But, um, you know, he, some people take it too far and some people a little more, you know, a little more reserved when it comes to that. But, yep. yeah. Or, you know, it makes me think about, and I need to write this, I need to write another note down because uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to enjoy the next scenario. Um, but it's, it's very much like um, it's so duplicitous and it's so subtle that everyone in supervision wants you to cut this corner, but nobody's willing to like just give you the, the permission slip. Uh, and it reminds me when I was um, so, you know, what the listeners may not know about this podcast is typically before the podcast, we have a brief discussion and almost invariably in those discussions, we talk about how we're not going to name names in these podcasts and stuff. So uh, some people can kind of figure out who we're talking about and you can certainly go back to the blog because I named every fucking name there is to know <laughs> in there and go nuts. Um, but our squadron, our squadron chief, remember when we had a whole bunch of code twos and um, our squadron chief said to to go J my cap and boy, that's a, that's a oh, big yeah. thing to unpack. Basically it's, you need this part desperately in order to be fully capable and you're willing to prioritize your jets over everyone else's and you're signaling to the air force supply system that it is dire and you absolutely need it because you are, you are incapable of doing certain missions. Uh, so what that's used for is stuff where the pilots, you know, have system reduced system reliability, not for safety of flight stuff, but it's reduced reliability on, you know, you know, whatever that system might be, the extra bells and whistles type stuff that limits their mission capabilities. Uh, so like when someone's come back with a code two for like, uh, I can't think of a good one off the top of my head, but it was like, you know, UHF radio scrambled or something like that right. or VHF or something really small. They tip, pilots typically write it up and then you troubleshoot it and you figure out what the most likely part is and you place it on order and the Air Force rack and stacks all the parts and says, okay, you're a training base in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we have we have real missions downrange. So we're going to prioritize the parts to them over you. Uh, so this squadron chief was getting really frustrated with the fact that we had all these parts on order with long-term delivery dates because, by the way, what we were doing was not important. And those write-ups we're not important for our non important fucking missions too. Right. Right. Uh, and then he directed, uh, he wanted every single minor write up to be ordered, uh, as a, as a J a my cap. And I remember, uh, TJ came in and he had a stack of 2005s, you know, I was a super and he had a stack of 2005s and he put them in front of me and I started fucking laughing hysterically. Yeah. And I was like, there is no fucking way I'm signing those 2005s. Nope. I said, there's one person that wants that done and he has the power to sign him. You can fucking, and it was when we were, when he was sharing a building with us, remember we used to talk yeah. mad shit about him with his right door there. open and just like, He's Oh, right this there. is so stupid. Yeah. Only an idiot would do these things. <laughs> like, can you imagine being a sackless chief that was unwilling to fucking walk around the corner and address two insubordinate shithead master sergeants like us and be like, if you have a problem with what I'm doing, talk to me. But the reality is when you know you're doing shady shit and you're a piece of garbage, you're not going to fucking challenge people. Uh, how great would that have been? if you walked in honestly <laughs> like that would have been great that would have been perfect oh uh, you're here uh so i told him i was like go in there that guy can sign every single one of those two fucking 2005s and then when there's a ig investigation which i definitely would have initiated uh he can answer for how he's completely abusing and criminally abusing the supply system and that goes back to the you know, let's try to shade it. Let's, let's bend the rules, but I don't want it to be my signature. And that is, that is just the ultimate signal to your personnel that you're going to fucking hang them out to dry. Um, well, you know, and, and it, it's, it's pretty clear, right? You're, you're in the regulations calling out J one A's exactly what they're for. Right. And there, there was no, there was no mis misinterpreting no. that there. It, it was, it was one way or no way. Right. Mm -hmm. And for him to, read it his his version of that when you have others telling you hey man that, that's not what it's for but it didn't matter because once again it's you're sacrificing this um yeah. compliance with a with the regulation that's once again it some regulations aren't, aren't black and white you can actually you know unfortunate but you can't write everything black and white this right exactly how to order parts it's exactly black and white. Yep. There's no question about it. Yep. Right. And I'll tell you so, what, if that, if that's something he wanted to do and he, what's interesting is he didn't walk in the office and go, okay, guys, here's the plan. This is why I'm doing it. 
I know that the reg says this, but we need these. The ops have been talking to me. They're saying that these things are a detriment, even though it's not on the, you know, it's not a PM status. And we're still going to order it. But he didn't do that. What he did was he talked to the assistant AMU OIC because he was a yes man that was completely sackless and amoral. Uh, you're welcome to look up any blogs titled when a leader is a shit leader and you can read about his stories. Um, he went to him instead as a, as a intermediary. And then that guy came to us and said, this is what we're going to do. This is the plan. Actually, I think he skipped us completely and went straight to TJ. Right. Uh, because he knew we were going to be a, a thorn. Uh, and that's like when you're trying to do stuff like that subtly, that's another marker that it's shady as fuck. Um, and it reminds me of, uh, you remember when uh, I think you were on mid shift and you asked me to help out with ERs and we started finding those radomes that had little oh, the radom. stuff in it. <laughs> so if you want to lay out a classic case of yeah. a classic case of compliance versus, you know, it, it should have been a film, the whole scenario. And for everyone to understand, this is exactly what's wrong with, maintenance right well one of the big things that's wrong with maintenance mm -hmm. but the fact that people are willing to once again pass their i guess judgment or um you know how they see a situation but once again there, there's some things that are just it's black and white there, there's no way around it and those radons being bad they were bad by the book if you want to call it that they were bad by the book yeah and we don't right? so i i never wrote about that story uh, it might be something no, you didn't. fun i uh, know i never did so i'm going to unpack what happened so uh, I'm, I'm, I think we're night flying um, and you were basically doing day shift hours and mid shift tasks, I believe. Uh, and I was the specialist section chief um, and you had a lot of, I think you were doing lead super and either way. both. Yeah. So you had a lot on your plates so and obviously ERs is the thing that kind of um, takes up a lot of time when you're putting eyes on jets and doing, you know, and I didn't, I didn't necessarily do quality looks. I did cursory looks because you right. know, I'm perfectly capable of, of, okay, let's narrow the scope of what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not going to look for, you know, crack leading. Well, you weren't phasing a jet, right? Nope. It's I just mean, Delta P's fluid levels, you yeah. know, obvious stuff hanging down, FOD and stuff. Um, hey, by the way, you're coming in a little blurry. No, I don't know what this is. F fucking goddamn COVID camera. It's probably a, <laughs> it says Logitech, but it's probably a wish piece of shit that I fucking way overpaid for. Uh, I'm going to do this and see if I can't reset the, anyway, well, okay. Anyway, if anything, it makes me look better. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what happened was, is I was going out and helping, uh, Eric do his ERs and I, obviously I was a crew chief for 20 years or well, at the time I was a crew chief for 15 years or whatever it was. And Eric, um, he had worked the line, but not being a crew chief, he just didn't have all the experience with inspecting airframe stuff. So um, I think I found a nicked radome and um, I, I, I called you over to be like, hey, look at this. You can see the you can see the fiberglass underneath and and the repair procedure for it is a specific like multiple step bonding sort of hardening thing. It's not a slap of RTV. It's not a slap of behalf because the real risk there is, is if that rain erosion coating kind of starts i mean you're talking about the the single point of the aircraft where all the the wind kind of comes and if it unravels it can catch some loose fibers and there's a distinct uh, possibility just... yeah and then of course you have a gigantic sucking vacuum in a single engine aircraft right behind it so if sure it's a it's a it's a kind of a critical piece to make sure the pilot doesn't die and i feel like that's kind of a big deal so um i pointed it out to him and then i call that like we called sheet metal well, we wrote it up, right? Like we wrote it up. Yeah, I wrote it up on a dash because I didn't know. Yep. Hey, it's an unknown right. condition. And we called out sheet metal for an eval. And the guy came out and he got out his book. And, you know, people that, that may not understand the Air Force, I think most of my listeners probably do. Uh, the books very rarely say if something's good to fly or not. It always says if it's serviceable or unserviceable. And what that does is it leaves it up to the discretion of the technician to decide if it's, if it's flyable or not. In this case, I knew it was... In my, I didn't know. In my time working on the line, that was almost exclusively always a red X condition because of the the risk of you know delamination that I kind of uh, described earlier. So we called sheet metal out, and he uh, evaled it, looked at the book, and he wrote up on a diagonal. And I was like, I don't think that's supposed. To, yeah. I think that's supposed to be an X. And I think we even came in the office and kind of talked about it, me and you, and maybe somebody else. And I was like, well, you know. Things change. I'm not a sheet metal expert by any stretch of the imagination. And the book only says serviceable and unserviceable. So it's not enough for me to make a stink over. 
Right. And you remember, like, as the week went on, we did more and more and we found more and more. And I remember we had some jets out on Echo, too, because, of course, in at Holloman, we have the lead super dual heading as mid shift super. And then we have jets on Echo as well, right. because <laughs> there's not enough fucking going on that you have to do that. Um, and you found one out on Echo. And I remember yeah. it was a little bit messed up by the zipper portion. And I said, oh, I think that's I think that's no big deal. So we wrote it up and then we called sheet metal out. And uh, the guy comes out and it was like a legit F-16 seven level. Cause that was also the problem with uh Holloman sheet metal is there was a lot of non F-16 guys and they just yeah. claimed that they didn't need to know F-16 and it, the, it wasn't an F-16 base. And uh, they were very reluctant to see us there because they had a very easy time on the aircraft that were there. And then we showed up with our broke ass old jets our and our shit jets and our ridiculous ops tempo. Um, but he came out and he red X'd it. And I was like, uh, I don't think that's supposed to be a red X. We haven't, your guys haven't been red Xing. He's like, nope, it's absolutely a red X. And then remember they got a big powwow. Yeah. That was that seven level from sheet metal that, um, you know, at first I thought the guy was a dick. Right. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I realized this guy really, you know, he's not being a dick. He really knows what he's doing. And, um, he really, yeah, he red X that. And the guy that came up before is a, I just started working 16s, but he yep. was over on the other side, the Reaper side, or whatever it was first. And then I was like, and, and that point, I'm the type of person, I mean, I don't have to explain it to you and probably a lot of my listeners either, but I'm the type of person, once I realize that there's something like wrong, like, so when all those other jets were diagonal, then this one was X'd. It was like, um, yeah, that means all the other ones are X'd too. So I started calling sheet metal out to look at all the flyers and I literally had <laughs> yeah. the OIC so as it was described to me, our squadron chief, who is of dubious character, social skills, and intelligence, um, the way it was described to me is he was he started screaming jarbled and you couldn't understand the words because the rage was causing him to speak in tongues. And he, he, he ran down the hall, which is an impressive feat considering his girth. And... Um, he started screaming at the OIC that I was, I think he accused me of being a saboteur or a terrorist or something. And I was, yeah. I, was I was breaking the fleet because I was like, I was calling over the radio because it's like, every time I see one now, I'm going to call it in. And he just kept every time he heard one and they're all flyers because those are the ones we were ERing. And they literally pulled me in the office and said, what are you doing? Yeah, it was, my response so, I was think my job. We were flying a, tw a 12 front, I think, right? 12 front sure. at the time, maybe. And uh, out of the twelve, out of the twelve, I think eight of them, eight of them had diagonals for yep. that radon problem. Yep. And um, because you were doing your ERs, and I remember this uh, this chief, you better get someone out there yep. else to do those fucking ERs, <laughs> right? That's what he said. You better get someone out there to do yep. those fucking ERs. And I'm like, well, chief, I got no one else here because uh, you know, I'm, it's just me and Chris here right now. That's it. So I'm like, and then I, you know, unless you want to go do it. Right which or said, had, by the way, he had which, ERs. He did. He could have. He, he could have fucking gone out there, and he could have signed off all those ERs. But again, right. he didn't want to have to put his name on it, and he expected all of us to turn to look away at something we now knew was a safety of flight issue. It was affecting right. multiple aircraft. Right. I mean, I got pulled into the office for a real conversation, and yeah. the conversation was, "What the fuck are you doing?" And I was there was not a scenario where I was going to back down from that conversation, like. You know, you know me pretty well, Eric, and you've been involved in yeah. a lot of the things. If I'm in the right, there is not a rank, there's not a rank power issue here. I'm going to be swinging on every motherfucker in the room if they're being, you know, shady. Could have um, been, uh, oh, Biden himself could have came down and said, <laughs> and he would have been like, nope. <laughs> you could get fucked. Yeah. Um, but I, I think after that, that's when uh, the squadron chief said he didn't want me to do any ERs anymore, which was funny because I was probably the most knowledgeable master sergeant in the unit at the time for all of that stuff. Well, and it wasn't even you making the call. It was the sheet metal right. seven level whose yeah. job it is to know this. And I, right? said, like, okay, I said, okay, well, go back to sheet metal. If you think this should be a diagonal, go to sheet metal and convince them. And then we can downgrade all these Xs. Like we can go to right. the group. And then, oh, by the way, we have to explain to the group how he misconstrued this as an X earlier and now it's really a diagonal. And that's a fucking hard conversation to have because it was on thin ice to begin with. Because you, once again, you were just writing up for an inspection, right? Yep. And um, yep. I, I know the sheet metal, um, their uh, super came out, the, the back shop super, yep. super came out, um, the sheet metal seven level, I think their OIC came out. There was like three or four of them out on Echo 
Um, I remember sitting out there waiting for him. But as you call them in, as you're doing ERs and you're calling them in, um, you know, hey, I, I, they were legit. And they had all agreed. And the one guy that wrote up the diagonal, the first, he even showed up. And, you know, he, he changed his tune a little bit, but yep. he, you know, he got educated. And it's stuff that had to get fixed. And it wasn't an easy fix. But, you know, yeah, we lose some sorties for one day, you know, maybe two days. But what's the alternative, right? Right. And supervision being okay with the alternative is the big problem we have, right? You know, and it makes me wonder, you know, we talked to Bear briefly uh, during the production conversation, but I always kind of wonder how much do pilots really know how much internal conflict is in an AMU and how often supervision will pressure people to sign off things that they know to be unsafe and every nobody tells the pilots a fucking word about it ever. Well, that's that's the, you know, your, when your pilot comes up, you, you you don't want to air your dirty laundry right in front of the ops, right? I mean, no, but do you no think the pilot would want to know that? that? Do you think the pilot would well, want yes. to know? Hey, we argued about this for about three hours a day, and everyone that was an expert said it shouldn't fly because it can delaminate and go down your intake. But our squadron chief really wanted this sortie, so we downgraded it, and now you're here. Like, I what mean, would the pilot do with that? No, he wouldn't even step in that airplane, right? Like, you, you, you wouldn't think. You, I mean, you wouldn't think. I, I don't know. It, there's a fine line. You, you gotta. You gotta you gotta bail on ops a little bit. You can't give them too much information, right? But you gotta give them just enough so they you know they can know what they're stepping into. But they that's where they put the trust and maintenance, right? So when they come out to the aircraft and it's got some code twos written up and everything, they they, they have faith that I mean that's a that's a lot of airplane to look at, right? But sometimes they, do they don't have faith. And, that's why they ask about fixes. That's why I have a bird board. That's why things kind of, I think there's a broken trust between ops and maintenance where ops is trying to second guess what maintenance is telling them sometimes, because I think they pick up that we do some shady shit. And I think there's a, there's an issue of trust there. Well, yeah. And even Barrett admitted it, right? Like yep. he knows that what it takes to get these jets flying. And if, like you said, if we, if we, some of these jets, they're, they're so old. There's so much stuff wrong with them. Uh, code twos and even some, you know, some stuff that I'm sure, I'm sure ops doesn't really want to know about in the yeah. back of their mind. Right. It's scary, huh? You know? And it's like getting in a rental car. I, 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 you get in the car and you just hope that everything's fine. And then you, you know, that the guy before you didn't beat the shit out of it too much. Right. That's fair. You know? Um, but on the other hand, um, if we were to just divulge all these problems we have in maintenance to ops, how many pilots are going to want to step to a jet and fly it? I mean, I won't. Would you? No. If, I remember. I remember when I got my first incentive flight in uh, 1999 in Aircraft 158. I knew the crew chief on it, and I showed up an hour before and pre-flyed the whole fucking thing because I knew that guy didn't do good maintenance. And I love him to right. death. He's a great. He's a great guy, but he was not a good crew chief. Um, like. And then I think uh, I think it might have been you and me. We were talking about uh, would you if we were offering an incentive flight now? Would you take one towards when we were both masters of Holloman? And it was an emphatic nope, nope, not at all. Uh, so uh, each each flight I took on when I, when I was in the sixty first, I had two two flights, and uh, one of the jets that I was scheduled for my second flight, I absolutely said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's spooky. I'll, I'll go to a different jet. It was because yeah. I, I I mean I knew I knew all the problems that jet was having. Uh, the engine, it was the engine. We had a stall after stall, <laughs> you know, Christ. some AV blowouts and we changed some components and, you know, I was an engine guy. So like, I'm, I'm, you know, you think I'd be okay with it, but it was the whole jet. There was just something wrong, you know, the vibe for it. So, um, you know, th there's a lot of maintenance that goes into these things and there's a lot of small things, but they, they start adding up quick, especially with the age of the jets. But when it's coming to safety of flight, like the radome yep. or anything, if ops knew what some supervision was willing to sacrifice in order to make a sortie happen because they, I can only imagine that some, some leadership are thinking, you know, they have ops's best interest in mind. I'm pretty sure ops wouldn't mind losing a few sorties knowing yep. that jet's going to be. Um, but it shines right. a light, right? It shines a light on you're, you're not ready. And that's when, well, and, and, and you saw it as many times as I saw it when you're sitting in a meeting, uh, shitty leaders are petrified of a question. I, how right. many times in our morning meeting, like at the AMU level, was I don't want any questions. Let's let's we don't we need to get our story straight so we don't have any questions. Oh yeah, um, right. Like when I was in the three fourteenth, uh, we we I can't remember what system it was. But we found a cannon plug disconnected, and that's why I mean it wasn't like a a, a safety of flight issue necessarily, but it, it certainly was a code three. Um, 
but it came back and then, you know, the guys looked and the cannon plug was disconnected. And then it was time for the afternoon production meeting and the OIC came in and was like, okay, um, what are you going to say? I'm going to fucking say the cannon plug was disconnected. Oh, well, that doesn't sound good. Well, that's actually factually what happened. So the cannon plug right. was off. That's... I can say it's off. I Disconnected sounds like a verb. Somebody undid it. I don't know like that. It's dangling there. Yeah. I'll say the cannon plug was off. He's like, well, I'm going to say the cannon plug was unseated, which doesn't sound as bad. I'm like, okay, well, you do your lie, and I'm going to tell the truth. And when, when they right. try to figure out what the fuck actually happened, I'm going to point out that you're lying. So now you have to fucking get on board with my story because I don't sugarcoat well, anything. It's the only story. No, right? not necessarily. If you could do the, you could walk that ethical line that that I mean, that's all about questions. Because the next question is, how did it get disconnected? And people well, that's are the, petrified of questions. But you know, look. So you have to be willing to. So let's take the radomes for example. So ops comes in and we say, hey ops, we just grounded eighty of your jets for your yep. first row sorties, and you're not going to make them. Why? What happened? Oh, we have bad radomes. And my first question from ops was like, you're telling me you have eight bad radomes in one day? Mm -hmm. Well, no, sir. We actually, they were written up on diagonal and we had them reevaluated and they were bad. Like, okay, so you talk it out, how it happened in the first place. And hey, look, ops will be happy. But I'm sure when you tell them like, hey, it's a possibility of you just sucking the thread down your engine and you're, and you're going to crash. Yep. Um, they should be okay with it, right? And, and sometimes they're not, which also puts extra pressure on, on yep. maintenance, right? But the stories to your, you know, we had um, the colonel right before we left, right? Um, remember him? Short guy. Oh, yeah. The guy that so, was in the three fourteenth as a DO is that who you're talking about? No, no. Um, oh, you're talking about the 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 guy that didn't like me. I know that doesn't no. narrow it down because nobody fucking liked me. But. <laughs> no, he. Um, I don't want to use names. Anyway, he was right before he left. Right, short guy. We're talking a pilot. Uh, no, he was the group commander. Or not the group commander. Um, Squadron. Yeah. No, no. He took over for the 54th. I'm going to edit all this out of the fucking okay. audio. <laughs> it's like like I've just seen all of it. Anyway, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, Sab. Right. All right, yeah. got it. That guy definitely would have asked those questions like, okay, first he's going to be mad that you lost X mm -hmm. amount of jets. Yep. But then he wants to know why. And then, well, why is not a bad question to ask, right? But when you make a mistake and you move on from it, right, you don't make it again. No problem. But, you know, yep. as leadership, if you keep bringing the same thing, like, oh, we made another mistake, we made another mistake, you know, it's going to add up quick. But sometimes things are just, you just got to swallow your pride and like, it is what it is. And realistically, sometimes when you're not resourced properly, your quality is always is like, if you need a high ops tempo, which means a high quantity and your resources are low, like quality is almost always sacrificed for quantity which means you're going to have an uptick in mistakes. So when, when, when the group commander's are like, hey, why does this stuff keep happening? The response should be, because I got fucking no people and half of them are burned out and a lot of them aren't experienced and everybody's trying to go to Korea and people are separating because they're fucking miserable. We've canceled leave. People are just not trying anymore. So that's your fucking answer. But nobody wants to say that. It's, yeah. oh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it around. And then you fucking pile on weekend duty and clean the hangers. And you just totally missed the fucking <laughs> boat of how to like turn shit around. Well, th well, think about it. Um, when you say, you know, the first thing you say, I don't want to hear you don't have any people. We know you don't have any people. Oh, right? I hate that. Okay. Like, are, are you, are you like, how can you remove the primary reason I'm struggling as an excuse? Right. Because you already know it. I have that no doesn't experience. invalid. That doesn't invalidate that it's the fucking right. absolute limb fact of why you suck right now. Right, it's the number one thing. I, we're, people are just burnt out. Too much maintenance going on. Not enough. Not enough people to do it. Not enough experience. I mean, getting experience in there. I mean, hey, hey, your uh, LCOM shows you have plenty of people. Yeah, they're all brand new three levels coming out of tech school. Right, I got twenty of those guys in my flight. What are you going to do with that? Yep. Right. You know, yep. you can't do anything with that. Um, so when when ops is you know, when ops is asking these questions or the group commander is asking these questions and leadership, you know, whether, whatever answer they throw out. But I think that's why it was good to have the, you know, the supers and the lead supers in that meeting sometimes because, hey, chief, it is what it is. Like we, we yep. this is the problem we're having. And the fix for it, I mean, it, it's, there is no fix for it really right now. I mean, you, you can apply. Yeah, you need a time machine. You yeah, need a yes. fucking time machine. Like, so right. Space Force should really fucking get on that. <laughs> uh, because Space Force. with the with the crunch for for fighter pilots and the low manning, like they have to fly 
and there's not enough people and they're getting fucking ground up. Like just today I published a anonymous article from somebody that sent me, you know, a, 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 a crew chief had killed himself um, over uh, within the last week where this person was and they were just super frustrated and tired of not being heard. And, you know, like, well, it, it's the, the burden that's placed on maintenance, right? And what you have to do is you have to have those people who are willing to do, I mean, we, we say it all the time, integrity, the right thing all the time. Yep. Right? And then that's you're punished for of, it. That's you're a bunch of baloney. Because it. it becomes baloney. inconvenient. And there's no such thing as convenient and inconvenient integrity. Integrity no. is the standard. And right. integrity is tested when it's inconvenient. Like, it's easy to fucking do the right thing when you have, you know, 24 healthy aircraft and you can just do a 24-7 and do a replacement. Yeah, that rate is bad because we got eight, eight in the hip pocket because we're fucking ridiculously healthy right now. That's right. not integrity. That's the fucking path of least resistance. Nobody's going to ask questions about it. Integrity is, oh, all eight of these jets are fucking bad that were on a diagonal three days ago. And I've signed ERs on them. Even though they're a diagonal, I know I now know that information not to be true. I can't in good conscience let these jets fly under my name on the ER. And right. as painful as it is, I have to go and have them relook at all eight of these jets. And maybe I'll get lucky. And maybe someone will be just small enough where it won't, won't, won't affect safety of flight. But it, to me, it really spoke to the culture in that unit. And from all the messages I've gotten from people all over the world serving in units, that was not a unique experience we had where there was people pressuring for stuff to be signed off and just to cut the corner. And what really is upsetting, and it goes back to what we were initially talking about, is none of them put their fucking names on it. And what happens is is when when you have systemic corner cutting as cooked, in, cooked into the recipe of your maintenance unit, um, that means it's not just going to happen when your supervision wants it out of convenience. It becomes the norm. So you've created a culture of non-compliance and everybody's cutting corners. People are just doing bit checks when they swap out a brakes on, on the LEFs and stuff like that. Even though TO explicitly says a bit check is not sufficient to check this, uh, but it's all over the place. It's fast pre-flights. It's, it's, you know, it's everything. And then when a jet goes down or, Somebody gets caught pencil whipping RWR in a training squadron where none of the shit worked anyway, and it's like the least fucking important thing to get pencil whipped, and you hammer fuck them with an Article 15. You have absolutely broken a trust because what you did for the last year is you signaled you can corner cut when it's convenient, but when you do it without our blessing, and not even blessing, without our implied blessing, because we can't, we have to have plausible deniability, and we want you to cut corners without our name on it and you hammer fucking with an article 15, your people are uh, essentially trapped because on one hand, they're, they're, it's demanded they have integrity. And when they have integrity, there's fucking monumental pressure from supervision to, to exclude this particular event from your integrity. And then when you do it later, you're a piece of shit and you're a bad maintainer and you're going to have your career destroyed. And how do you well, function in that? You can't. The, I mean, the, 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 you know, if you're one of those guys that, like I said, the Air Force has a lot of different personalities and maintainers, right? There's that guy that will do anything to get the job done. There's, there's the guy that goes out there and, you know, he'll, he jerry rigs some kind of crazy tool to fit in this, you know, and gets the job done no matter what. But these guys that are out there and they're, they're sacrificing their integrity in order to, you know, it, it's, a, it's a crappy situation to put them in. Like, hey, you, we're not going to put you on pre-flights anymore. We're not going to put you on yep. engine bays anymore because you ride them up too much, right? So yep. the expediter decides or the yep. super calls, hey, I don't want this guy on, on, on phase jets anymore or whatever. Yep. You know, we want a guy on there that's going to play ball with us. And, yep. you know, right? Um, and it's the same thing even in QA, sending the guy out like, oh, don't, don't call that guy out to the phase jet. He's going to yep. tear it up, right? Yep. Call this guy out, right? Yep. It, it's it's a, such a bad spot for us to, you know, for the Air Force to to push maintenance Meaning, hey, we kind of sacrifice our time, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we're out of time, so we're going to sacrifice quality and compliance yep. in order to make up time. Yep. Or we're out of resources, so once again, quality and compliance go out the door, yep. right? And it's a shitty way to, 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 to put a young airman into, put a young staff sergeant into. Shit, even a pro super, right? I mean, yep. like, hey, now you're talking about senior and master. You're like, hey, we're not going to yep. you're, you're not going to You're not going to play ball. Yeah, you're not going to get promoted. Yeah. Right. And um, that, it, it's unwritten, but it's for sure. It happens. And what's really funny is when you happen to run into a scenario where someone follows the book explicitly, like every impound I ever worked, it was like, okay, 
there's a method here. We are we're going to go from a broke state and I am going to get us to a fixed state and it is going to be exhaustive and it is going to be a, the best maintenance we can ever possibly do because my pride is and my goal is this never comes back. So and, go ahead. How come that's OK for an impound? Well, that's what I'm getting right. at. What's funny is yeah. it's not because then they fucking lose their mind after like a day and a half. They're like, what's the status of the impound? I'm like, oh, well, I spent all of yesterday uh, reading the history of the jet. Well, what did you do on it? Uh, it sat there roped off. Right. And then I read the history of the jet because I need to know everything that was done. I need to know all the troubleshooting that other people did. I need to see why they picked this component. You know, I need to know everything. And then I'm going to start building the plan of action. I want to keep it in a failed state and I'm going to go at it. And I'm probably uh, tipping my hand for the impoundment discussion that's going to come later. But, um, you know, and they start flipping the fuck out because when you follow the, that's what's really funny. When you follow the book, to include all the cure checks, how long shit actually takes to cure, to to full blown landing gear ops checks instead of just a quick doors open gear swing type of deal up and down in ten minutes. When you're when you're doing everything and and checking everything, a you start finding shit broke because it's never ops checked appropriately. Like there was a lot of jets at Luke that had um, landing gear isolation valves that were bad, but we never we always skipped the free fall portion to verify the yeah. landing gear isolation valve was actually letting the gear fall down. Um, so when you start doing stuff by the book, first of all, you start finding all the shit that has been pencil whipped for the last few years. But also when you go by the book, it takes time because quality maintenance is an expensive process and time experience and, and manpower. And they're used to, well, we did a motor, we had a motor out, a bay done and a motor in on one shift yesterday. I don't understand why you're taking two days on this engine bay. Oh, well, we're doing, we're not doing the pull the motor, wipe down three things, call QA. And then we're basically going to rely on QA to do our engine bay for us uh, and call right. it a day. Like, like chiefs and colonels, they're so accustomed to the corner cutting maintenance that when actual quality maintenance shows up, it seems like people are sandbagging is what it is what it feels like. Right. Well, which is, which is a hundred percent accurate because if you, if you get a guy, you know, it, I've done it myself as a super, right? Like you put some pressure on to get the bay done, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, engine install, it, you know how long it takes, right? And to me, a bay could take day, days, right? Depends on the bay. Like some guys are faster, some guys are slower, right? Like a, a, a low, a low discrepancy bay, you're looking at three, four hours. And that's like right. it, the motor was just out and you're doing a cursory look, you're hitting the carded right. items and you're doing a FOD check and all that stuff. But if it motor's been in there since phase or some crazy amount of time, like, like every crew okay. chief, every expert is like, as soon as they pull that motor out and they see the filth, like that's, that's the fucking, uh, that's the timetable of right. figuring out how, how old dirty the bay is. is. It? Oh, yeah. it's filthy as fuck. <laughs> okay. This shit's going to be fucked up. And nobody can remember pulling the motor. Like, well, I think that guy did it two years ago, but he PCS like, okay. This bay is going to be like two or three right. days. Be prepared. Well, you know, like I said, the pulling the engine in the bay or whatever maintenance is, you know, once again, you're sacrificing time, right? And leadership has gotten so accustomed to things being done quickly. And I, once again, I, I can't believe, I can't believe it's still done in the Air Force, but, you know, a failure is never an option, right? Yeah. Okay. It absolutely should be an option at some point. When you're doing an impound versus regular maintenance, and you know, I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit. I remember some some supervision at Holloman. Look, they didn't give a shit how long an impound took. Right? Oh bullshit! No, nah, well, I, I did. I said some. Okay, I okay, that's fair. All. That's fair. Okay. Oh, my my bad. Right, some leadership at Holloman. They they really didn't give a shit how long an input took. Because, good leadership. The good leadership. Yes. And we how did many have were there? Some, how many were there? Two. 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 Maybe. There's two. Okay. Right, but. <laughs> Okay. So, some of the chiefs would brunt the pressure of the squadron, right? Yep. Okay, fine. Um, and, you know, they had their, their tolerances for how long something could take, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when they think it's an easy impound, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a, you know, engine, an engine vibe is not an easy impound, nope. right? Especially when we didn't have a test cell to run an engine on, right? So it's yep. not really not an easy impound. <laughs> uh, a, gear, a gear impound could be yep. a relatively easy impound, right? Sure. Um, but you being on impounds... And versus Joe Blow seven level doing on a regular code three yep. or you know a five level, it's night and day in, in my opinion. The the pressure that's put on those guys yep. to do something that's a code three versus you or any other impound official to to work through an impound. Well, what is the difference? A code three you can't fly a jet, right? Yep. An impound you can't fly a jet, yep. right? 
and it's been code three maybe multiple so the, times. So the rigor, the rigor should be the same. Should be, yep. but it's definitely not. Well, it goes right? back to, um, and I said, I said this when I was a, a, a super and a section chief and some other conversations. Um, we in aircraft maintenance were much more focused on greening up the jet than fixing the jet. And those oh, are sometimes yeah. two different things. It's what do we need to do to get this jet greened up so it can fly tomorrow? Oh, well, there's like a 50-50 chance it's this valve. All right, we'll just change the valve ops, check it. Well, it's intermittent, I don't know. Well, I'll just change it anyway. It'll green up. Just get it done before the eight-hour fix rate, right? Um, whereas if you're focused on fixing the jet, it takes a little bit more time, but you're you know, you're, you're, you're getting quality fixes, you're duplicating, you're, you're chasing it down, you're doing good troubleshooting. It takes time to do that. It also takes experience to know how to do that, which right. you, you, experience comes from failing and not, <laughs> do, not doing well or exhausting the FI, or it's like you do everything in the FI, then it says return to service. You're like, but the motherfucker still won't start. Oh, my <laughs> returning it to service, but it still doesn't start. Um, that's where you get into the fault. You know, so you get into the, um, you know, the theory of operation and the schematic, and you're literally looking at this is how the fluid goes, this is when it does, this is when the valves open up, and you sit there and you listen to it, whatever it might be. Um, but it's expensive to grow somebody that can fix a jet, not just green up a jet. But imagine, imagine the quality of maintenance you would get out of these, you know, staffs and techs as they move along their career if they were allowed to do that yep. as airmen. Yep. Right? I mean, opening up a schematic and following a wiring diagram or, or, you know, um, how oil flows through the engine, you know, how everything works together. But that is completely lost on yep. maintainers now, because once again, they're sacrificing their time. So imagine, you know, as an end of troop, you come out there and you have an oil light, you know, you know, okay, let me sit down and you should know the theory of operation for oil, depending on your yep. skill level. Right. But in reality, most people, you know, they boot through those FTDs and they're, you know, it's just kind of, they brain dump it. Right. It's the same people that when you have a, a, a hydraulic oil light and they find a pop circuit breaker for the oil pressure indicator and they go, oh, okay, I have a pop circuit breaker. It says oil on it and I have a hydraulic oil light. So it must be reset the circuit breaker and right. call it a day. Even though those are two completely different circuits, because one's a low oil sure. pressure switch and the other one's an indicator. And that's where that rigor of, okay, let's follow the schematic. Let's, okay, oh, it, this doesn't go anywhere through this that doesn't make any sense you know and that's the chasing the green up versus you know trying to get the jet fixed where you actually have to dig right. it and figure it out and that's an expensive thing to build well it's a it's a it's a it's a big sacrifice you know yep. if we made it's if, an if investment. for some reason right you, that's, is it you make an investment in these in these young airmen and these guys that guys and gals that go out there and they you know really learn how to troubleshoot yep. because that's that's something people don't know today they, they learned from the staff sergeant that, hey, I remember this one time, the staff sergeant told me it could have been this problem, so let's check that out. They yep. go straight to the punt list in the, yep. in the tech order, which, by the way, isn't, the, isn't it lined up in the, in the probable cause that this unit or this LRU caused yep. this problem? It's mm -hmm. ease of maintenance, yep. right? So, yeah, oh, you're going to start at the easiest maintenance first, but people automatically dive to the punt list because their lack of troubleshooting skills. Yep. And because they don't have troubleshooting skills, because we don't allow them time to yep. build those skills. Yep. Again, it becomes compliance, right? Cover cornering and quality. Yep. And not just quality of the maintenance, but quality of the people who are doing the maintenance. Yep. Right. And you and I both know there's some crew chiefs out there that are, man, uh, like so good at what they do. Yep. Right. And yeah. Badasses. Absolutely. Badasses. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's always a handful, but this seems to be a little less and less. Well, what's interesting is I remember in 2010 when I was at Luke, when we had, and this is no exaggeration, we had 110 crew chiefs in the TAM section in 2010 because there was this massive, damn. there's this, it, by the way, as a section chief, that's a goddamn nightmare because it's a fucking 20 EPRs a month or some dumb shit. Um, but what would still happen, it was, it was, it was mind blowing. We had an expediter that was, I don't know, he wasn't that great. Uh, but what he would do was he would still get his A team. The jets would come down, broke light in the gear handle or, you know, whatever. And he would still have his A team of like the five heavy hitter maintenance guys that were just, you know, diehard mechanics that knew everything. And he would put those five on the hard broke jet and the airmen would just launch. They would catch their jet, BPO pre, pull their forms, and he would cut them back and send them home. And it's like, yeah, I get oh. it. You still want to turn your jets for the next day, but you need to you need to split these five people up, even though they work together great and they're great guys. I love them all, but you need to put one or two together and then two or three airmen and just 
attach him at the hip, and then let the airmen actually do the work. Because in 2010, we could have been building great technicians, but instead we were giving them cutbacks. And then four right. years later, they were staff sergeants that didn't know how to so fucking install a wing tank. The guys, you know, the guys or gals that would, you know, at the time, hey, I'm not getting cut back. I got stuck on this code yeah. three and blah, blah, blah. You know, they're not going to get it at the time. But if it took someone yeah. to explain it to them, like, listen, to me, I'm, I'm really trying to build your future here, right, yeah. as, a, as a maintainer. Um, you know, and hey, everyone loves cutback sandwiches, no problem, right? But you can but, get cut back any other night when you got 110 fucking people in the section. Stay well, late tonight. A ton. Yeah, I know. That's rare. Right. It was ridiculous. Air Force had a big opportunity. when We were, we were sitting fat, dumb, and happy for a while, right? Yep. For a little bit. And, and we then blew they it. Did that massive, that massive cut. We did. We blew it. I mean, yeah, we fucked it all up. I remember one of the one of the best crew chiefs I ever knew uh, in the 61st. Uh, I saw him walking out of the break room in his in his nicely pressed, you know, uniform. Not his maintenance coveralls or his shitty uniform, but his really nice show uniform. I said, man, where are you going? He's like, oh, I go to the squadron. He got booted because he, you know, he had some problems in the past, and he was yeah. on part of that. Oh, for, uh, yep. not for a little bit. Yep. Poor shaping. Right? Yep. Poor shaping. He was the best crew chief. One of the best cruises we had, and I, I couldn't believe we were letting him go. We literally picked the, we picked the shit that didn't matter and made that the discriminator ah. for keeping the Air Force. But we're pro- wow, this camera is fucking hot garbage, huh? Um, <laughs> we're probably uh, a little off topic, and we're probably running out of time too. Um, yeah. But because I'm trying to keep these a little bit more succinct, so I don't I don't latch sure. people to my uh, meanderings for two three hours. Um, but you know what? Here's 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 my parting message for the people out there. You need to recognize that you need to give your people space to grow. You need to create a culture where they're where they're backed up, where they're taken care of when they're standing up for something that's broken and grounded. Yeah, I know it sucks. It's hard to be the person when you find something on a pre-flight. When you find something on a pre-flight that's fucked up and you're the only person that knows about it, it's really fucking hard not to cover it up or pretend like it's not there. And then you go to your expediter and it takes a lot of bravery to do that because you know, you're destroying your night. Cause you know, when you find your jet broke, you're the one that's going to be sitting with it. And you're also destroying some other people's nights too. Cause if it was a good night, now it's not a good night, but just think about how soul crushing it is when you go up, you get the nerve to go up to your expediter and he goes, uh, we can't afford to do that tonight. Can you, you know, make that go away? Uh, I would just say, give your people the room to to have integrity to not make it too difficult to call things broke give them the room to learn and it's going to take longer and you know anybody that's higher rank and that's that's listening to this which i don't know if anybody is but you know recognize that the cost of quality maintenance is going to be time and shit needs to slow down because if the quantity stays high the quantity the quality is going to be in the gutter and someone's going to die eventually do you have anything else eric yeah, you know, um, I, I just want to say that, you know, this, these changes that, you know, like I said, growing these individuals and, and taking this time, that, that comes from guys that are already sitting in the, in the super office right now. The guys, the lead supers, the supers, the expediters, um, even the section chiefs, right? Um, make, make that stand a little bit, right? Don't be, don't be so yeah. afraid of your squadron leadership. And I, yeah. I don't want to say afraid, but hey, they're going to respect you more for it, man. In, in my opinion, you know? and if and if they don't, you don't want their fucking. Well, you don't want their endorsement. Anyway. Yeah, fuck but, them anyway. You know, it's easy for us to say, and, and and there was, you know, there was a point in our career to reach where like we don't we don't really give a shit about making yeah. rank or anything else anymore. Um, taking care of your guys and gals is always top priority for a section chief. Uh, you know, supers taking care of maintenance and taking care of the jets top priority. You gotta you gotta marry those two together somehow, yeah. right? And. Um, once again, right is right, and everyone knows what right is. You wouldn't, yeah. be, you wouldn't be in the military for you know, 15, 20 years if you didn't know what right was. Yep. You know? So just really don't be that afraid. And you know, there's, People want to hear solutions to your problems. They don't want to hear just a problem. Yep. They also want to hear a solution, but make it the right one, right? I mean, that, those TOs, those, those, those instructions, they're all written black and white. It's very easy to read, right? So start reading, <laughs> yep. you know? And even if you can't come up with a solution, that doesn't that doesn't mean you can't point out the problem because sometimes no, you just might right. not have the foresight to know what the solution is. But most hey. times the solution is going to be, hey, these words written at an eighth grade level with the fucking pictures on the other page, that's the solution. <laughs> and we just have to right. do what the fuck it says is the answer. Yeah. Okay, I well, um, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day today, Eric. Uh, and I really hope you come back for the impound discussion. So I'm gonna yeah, of, it's going to be fun. And, and what I want to do with that is I'm going to make it an open Zoom call for anybody that follows the page. They can join. So it'll almost be like they can ask questions too. So it might be a little bit crowded. Um, but 
Uh, I encourage any of you listening to follow me on Facebook, 20 Years Done, the Facebook page, and also 20yearsdone.com if you want to hear me dropping dimes on piece of shit leaders and I name names. But other than that, adios. I have to awkwardly go to the record button.